Greetings Lore Seekers and welcome to another episode of the Lost Archives, a Star Wars Legends Lore series. Today we're going to talk about the Crate Dragon, a native creature to the planet of Tatooine. Creature of such power and ferocity, the Jedi Order even named one of their lightsaber forms after them, which would typically be known as the Way of the Crate Dragon. But, what do we know about the creature? Well, we know that the creature from the time it is born until the time of its death, it will continuously grow throughout its life. The average being about 45 meters and weighing about 20,000 kilograms. That is heavy, by the way. And that they would live approximately 100 years, approximately, and would not actually suffer from any of the ill effects that come with aging. Mating season would typically be in the summer seasons on Tatooine and during the time the howling of crate dragons could be heard throughout the canyons of Tatooine and the collection of frenzied beasts would scare even the mightiest of sand people to run away. On that note as well even using their hunting cries are very much good for scaring away sand people is what Obi-Wan did when he scared them away from Luke Skywalker as he imitated one of, it, imitated one of its hunting cries in order to scare them off. Luke is later shown using this trick in Legends material when he first encounters the Vonskris to a more interesting degree. If you were a young sand person wishing to complete their coming of age ritual you would be unfortunate enough to have to want to get a crate dragon pill and the best way of doing this is slaying a crate dragon. So here are some things to be mindful of. Obviously they are powerful combatants with many many sharp teeth, claws and the ability to burrow in sand. At least some variants of them. So things to be wary of. They can secrete a very lethal venom, venom either through its teeth or its spines. This poison being so deadly that even criminal underlings and various people will use it to use it to dispatch their foes. However, there are several key weaknesses you can take care, take advantage of. For example, it can be a lord out of its holes and essentially sanctuaries with the allure of prey. Now, banthers are the best bet in doing this. Now, I know banthers are sacred to the sand people, so you may not wish to use this particular method, but it will be the best one of getting them out of their cave. At least Revan found that this method was the best way of approaching the cave when he was trying to find the star maps. On that note as well, one thing about crate dragons is, is they are also attracted to force nexuses, specifically those of the dark side, which is why if you have played KOTOR 1 you find one guarding the cave where a star map is hidden. Another way in which you can get a bead on crate dragons is firing blaster bolts straight into their sinus cavities. This will allow you to basically deal a headshot straight to the brain of the creature, killing it instantly. An easy way of dealing with it, possibly not the most honourable way depending on the traditions of your tribe. Another major weakness is as well is that they only seem to see in certain two-dimensional shapes, meaning that sometimes they will attack your shadow. You can use this to your advantage, but truth be told, that might be a bit deadly for you if they attack your shadow. Awesome, you can then get out of dodge and then make an attack or a getaway. If they swipe the other way... Sorry mate, that's all she wrote. You're probably uh, going to join the countless numbers of sand people who have tried to claim the part of a great dragon. Though, to be fair, thinking about it, you can just use sheer for brute force and ignorance depending on how many that you are and what your strategy is. Personally, in KOTOR 1, I set up a bunch of mines before they got close and watched as the poor bugger walked over them. Uh, not exactly honourable, but it did bring an end to the uh, battle before it really began. <laughs> One thing to also be mindful of is there are certain hollow thrillers out there, for example ones depicting the life of Luke Skywalker. Uh, in this case I am talking specifically about Luke Skywalker and the dragons of Tatooine, where Luke is depicted wielding his, his lightsaber 
riding on the back of a banther, charging into battle, fighting a fire-breathing Crate Dragon. Crate Dragons do not breathe fire, and in fact Luke in Legends did take exception to this, saying it's full of inaccuracies. Solo thought it was um, pretty fair and amusing, as Han would. Now moving on, so far everything we've talked about is pretty bare bones. What I mean by this is when they say Crate Dragon, there is only there's actually two versions of the Crate Dragon living on Tatooine. There is the standardised Crate Dragon, which is known as the Canyon Crate, which is the smaller of the two and is the four-legged variant that most people encounter. With the Canyon Crate Dragons, the spines and structure of its cranial ridges and even its tail all appear to be different. So no two canyon crates look alike. There's even one specific variant that has a two-pronged tail, which means it can use the good old Stegosaurus tactics in any fight with you, so be careful of that. But yes, on to the greater crate dragon. These creatures are different to their canyon counterparts. In fact, their average length, length is a hundred meters. So tell you what, uh, I'm just going to pop an image up on the screen from uh, Wikipedia. It will be in the description. There you go. As you can see, there is a canyon crate and fighting its greater crate relative with two sand people running away going, oh no. As you can see, just the head and the neck of it is about the size of the canyon crate. Now, these crates were much rarer to see than, it, than the regular canyon crates as they spent long periods of time literally swimming through the sand. They had about 10 legs, which gave them the ability to effortly maneuver through the sand. So why, why would they be spending long periods of time doing this? Well. Unlike Banthas for the Canyon Crates, the most rarest of delicacies for these super predators would be the Sarlacc. That's right, the Sarlacc, the Great Pit of Carcoon. Better watch out because this legendary dragon is coming for it. And boy oh boy, well if it gets its hand on you, you're in trouble. Similar to their Canyon Cousins, they also do produce Crate Dragon Pearls. Though, considering the size of the creature, they are usually much larger and much more valuable for this. But, with proper fashioning and various other things, they could also be used be used part as part of a lightsaber. Which meant that, if for whatever reason you have several Jedi accompanying you on your coming of age ritual, and you're unlucky or fortunate enough to come across a greater great dragon, they're going to be wanting that pill, so it might be a case of you take the pill back, you prove it to them, and then you sell it to the Jedi for so many credits, which you could probably then use to get more moisture evaporators for your tribe. Uh, thinking about it, I'm probably going to have to do a video on the Sand People as well, because their culture is actually quite in-depth, and it is lightly touched upon in the movies and even some of the cartoon series. Oh, just to give you a rough idea of how much a greater crate pearl would be worth, it'd be... I think it was about... 100,000 credits each. That is a lot of money. That will get you a lot of stuff. Anyway, your future treasure hunting dreams aside, how does this fit into the Tatooine culture? Well, to the Sand People, they were seen as... A powerful hunter and centered as I said before their coming-of-age rituals around it adolescent males who were essentially abandoned by their tribes in the Tatooine dune and only accepted back in as adults when they had slain a crate dragon and their proof of this was coming back up with a pearl Jawas seemingly held crates in high regard and essentially in a, a, a position of a path of spirit, believing that their bones possessed quite a lot of magic. So Jawas brave enough to acquire the accusation of crate dragon bones were held in very high regard among the rest of the Jawa population. In fact, this 
dr this creature was so ingrained into regular Tatooine society and culture that it was said that a crate dragon was an integral part of the Tatooine pre-wedding party for the group to be. <laughs> it's probably fortunate that Luke decided to have his wedding on Coruscant in the Corellian style instead, otherwise that could have been a particularly messy situation. Not sure for the groom or for the dragon itself. One interesting of note as well is if you ever get a chance to look at the iconography of the backs of sand people, they are they are actually made from the skulls of fallen great dragons. I'm assuming there's some sort of process involved to make them smaller, probably smashing it up, um, or even just hunting smaller crates in order to uh, get a you know appropriately sized backpack for yourself. I suppose you'd be able to tan the skin as well. But on a final note about the crates, a former Jedi who eventually turned to the dark side during the reign of Palpatine, who was actually raised by Sand People along with his father, would take the name Darth Crate as if to honour the creature when he became a Sith Lord. He'll be getting his own video as well. Anyway, as always, if you like what you heard, consider leaving me a like, maybe sharing this around, help me spread and grow the channel maybe. Uh, if you didn't like this, obviously leave me a dislike and a bit of criticism down below, maybe just to help out the channel a little bit. And if you haven't done already, hit that subscribe button and check the bells for notifications. As always, my sources will be listed below and I will catch you guys on the next episode of The Lost Archives. Take care Law Seekers and have a good day.